Hi, my name's Bob Grunier, and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. So, welcome to Thor How. This 21st of January, 2023. So, uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me out there? Hi, Mr. Holmes, Gordon Doherty, Dan Moretti, William Schwant. Hi, Dave Strom, Corky Goss is in the house. Artifact, Nick Moore, Ken Pratt, Stuart N, Squirrel, One. How far have we got here? NG. Hello, EBB. And who else have we got? Hi, Rick Boyd. Pleased to meet you here. Hi, Louis Navarro. And D2105K. And Finn Bear Definti. And of course, Artifact. Hi, Estonias. And Justin Forder. Hi, Harry. Hi, Green Hiker. Hi, Three. It's great to have you here. Okay, so what are you looking at on the screen here? Well, this was a gas analyzer that was, uh, as far as I understand it, an independent body that came in to test a number of the Malcolm Bendel thunderstorm generators on the 18th of January 2024. Uh, you can see that here in this part of the screen. And this sample was taken from one of the modified Honda generators at 1309. And you can see here that the NOx is at 23.0 ppm. The sulfur dioxide is at 5.95 parts per million. The carbon monoxide is at 361.8 parts per million. And the CO2 is by volume at 6.06% and the O2 is at 14.43%. This was for a sample flow rate of 0.6 litres per minute into this highly super duper gas analyzer. Uh, the date of expiry for the calibration is the 20th of March 2024 down the bottom there so it is certified for operation and it was passed with something else on the 1st of the 12th 2023 as far as I can see down there so uh, it's all good to go now what does NOx at 23.0 parts per million mean coming out of a thunderstorm generator's exhaust? Well, the European Union NOx emission limits for different classes of petrol cars, and this is a petrol generator, uh, is 970 parts per million for the 1992 class Euro 1, and currently, or rather, maybe not currently, but um, the Euro 6 from 2014 specification is 60 parts per million. So uh, as you can see here, 23 parts per million is less than 60 parts per million. Hi, James Vickers and Garden Jackpot. Great to have you join us this day. Now, there were other tests and you may have seen me use this device and I will show you a couple of other images of that. This actually monitors hydrogen sulfide here, H2S, parts per million. And this is toxic, I think, at about 10 parts per million. Okay, uh, This kills, I think, maybe six people a year in the US, um, H2S. There is actually no known cure for H2S. If you have too much of it, then um, you are gone done for as it were carbon monoxide here uh, this is the oxygen level and here we have the total percentage of combustible gases on the right here this is some of the equipment that was used uh, earlier this week in the tests of the generators and these tanks here are the control gases and um they brought those along with them, you know, to do the calibration or controls. 
and this is the overall uh, various gas analyzer components. Hi, Paul O'Neill and Starfish Troopers podcast and Venom K and Stevio Albatross. Great to have you here also. And James Vickers again. So, right. Um, I was actually given a, a little unit that looked like this. And why? Well, I was hoping to get an opportunity to video the things coming out and in the coherent uh, matter traveling waves, as I like to call them, that we had observed on various geek videos and that we had seen and got me interested in the thunderstorm generator and that uh, Hank Uren and David Boutnier had created in their various Vega experiments. And so one of these generators was set up and um, Malcolm went off and did the accounts and before he did that, he gave me this little unit here, this uh, safety meter that you attach to yourself, much like a dosimeter for radiation, but this is a dosimeter for gases uh, that might cause you a problem, the H2S, the carbon monoxide, and of course, if there's any explosible gases in the atmosphere, that might be nice to know as well. And it occurred to me, that I was uh, standing about uh, about four or five meters away. I think the room was about 10 by eight meters. It was a kind of warehouse type thing with a high ceiling. Malcolm had cracked the two garage type draw doors, which were double aspect on the building. And there was a door open. Um, <laughs> to my great shame, I didn't think about the fact that carbon dioxide is actually heavier than air, but carbon monoxide is lighter and so it would fill up from the top. Um, however, I'd been in there with this uh, Honda 550 modified generator for some two hours or so with it just running in the background when I was um, doing stuff on my computer, uh, with it being like, I say, five meters away or something. And it occurred to me that this uh, detector here uh, had not rung an alarm at all. And so I was a little bit concerned because uh, I thought, well, maybe it's not working. So I thought, well, I'm going to go and try and see if I can get any joy out of it and, and just see what it would do when I put it right next to the exhaust. And you can see here I'm probably about, oh, God, sorry, sorry uh, maybe uh, three inches away, something like that, three or four inches away, maybe, yeah, maybe three inches away. Um, and... I shared this video, uh, which you can see on this link here. There's no need to go into that. But the highest, at this distance away, parts per million of carbon monoxide that I was able to read was 197 parts per million. Uh, you can see that the oxygen here has dropped from 20.9% um, to 20%. So uh, you can imagine that there's some en lots of entrained air in here. But it's, it's this figure that I was most concerned about and I, I was um, you know I didn't have a headache uh, I had no problems breathing um, so you know I had to kind of basically accept that this probably was the real reading of what was coming out of there and it was it was a bit surprising to me now the alarms go off because um, anything over 25 parts per million is considered toxic if constantly exposed for an eight hour period and as this is a dosimeter you would want to know when it's reached that threshold but you can actually you know um, s suffer uh, quite a bit larger than 25 for short periods of time and so you know that's why that's uh, flashing and beeping and buzzing it does everything you can possibly imagine interestingly enough there is no h2s here i didn't detect anything h2s coming out of here uh, and the there's no combustible in here. So, you know, the idea potentially um, that hydrogen is coming out here, well, one might imagine that that would be detected here because obviously hydrogen is a combustible gas. I need to find out whether these devices will actually detect hydrogen. Someone did say there was some crosstalk between hydrogen and, and other things that might be sensed. 
and that might be an issue issue so my question here is no combustible gases and as i go through uh, this um little presentation today i want you to think about what i'm going to say and um maybe do a little bit of your own research and uh give me some feedback um because uh, uh i not a emissions expert um but i'm showing what i've found and i guess the most important thing that i found other than uh, that this was lower was that around 30,000 people die every year from carbon monoxide poisoning so this is equivalent to 10 times 911 let's put it like that and so if everyone can imagine you know uh, what was put in motion because of the deaths on that incredibly tragic day this is 10 times that number of people every year, year in, year out. Um, and so, you know, that doesn't only, it, it's not the only thing, really, that, that one should consider. It's that this actual gas, it's colorless, it's odorless, and the result um, of that is that you can end up breathing it in, and it doesn't only kill people, it actually causes, uh, you know, can cause uh, severe brain damage. Um, so if there's 30,000 people dying, then how many people in the world actually suffer severe long-term effects from a single unfortunate exposure? And in the after I got home from testing it with this one evening, and it's not like it was a sanctioned test. It was like, I've got this device in my hand, and maybe I can see what it's actually doing with no other device. Like, because... Uh, Honestly, when you, you, you watch someone else do a test and they've got the device and it's always been in their control with the best will in the world, um, you can't necessarily say that maybe that hasn't been tampered with or there's some you know shenanigans going on by some third party or was it calibrated in the right way. You know, it was an opportunity for me to do my own test uh, in an unexpected way that I'd never seen being done. In fact, it would never been done using this device. And, you know, after I'd done it, and I, I kind of showed again this to a third party, um, the following day I managed to convince, and it wasn't very hard, I just said, can I just test the uh, unmodified 550, uh, well, 5500 uh, generator, um, in the same way and Malcolm said yeah sure I haven't done it in like five six years why not <laughs> so um pulled it out and uh, turned it on and it immediately made a noise and this is when I was absolutely shocked so when I came home from this I actually looked at the Honda manual and the Honda manual said that any of these generators even the smaller ones they must be 25 feet away from you know any house or caravan or tent or whatever and i'm just wondering have you ever been on a tent site a caravan site um or you've been at a music festival or whatever and there's generators and they're like very close to um you know um where people are actually breathing and one one that sticks in my mind is when you go to these fairs and there is a um a bouncy castle and the blower on the bouncy castle is being powered by a generator and it's just behind the bouncy castle that's not 25 feet away so and, and this is the warning for this is actually three times in the manual for the honda generators of this kind they're deadly serious about it and they talk about death and they say like if you want to avoid dying just follow those instructions um so uh, and and i actually grew up on a farm and you know, we often had generators and, and petrol engines and, and diesel generators and, and, and diesel engines. And, you know, it was just part of life, uh, smelling this stuff in. And it really brought home to me the horrific situation that people are in, in um, places like the highly polluted cities of India. And really, it isn't, it, even if this doesn't produce any excess heat, Oh, sorry, excess energy, if it's not any more efficient, I mean, as long as it's not worse, and even if it doesn't do anything else, just getting rid of carbon monoxide is a absolutely game changer in terms of quality of life. Um, for people that grow up in these cities, they probably never smelt fresh air. 
on on a daily basis. But it's the toxicity. I just didn't realize. I grew up with no catalytic converters. I'm sure many of you did too. And 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 I I had to reevaluate because I was I was talking to one of the guys there. And he was saying that, well, honestly, when these engines came in, he didn't think that they were going to be delivering what they were claimed to be delivering. And then he's just had to come to learn to accept it. And he said, uh, and I was talking about this uh, detector here. And he says, y you know, if you actually go near a motorway, often these detectors will go off. And it occurred to me that I, I don't know if it's the case in other countries that you're living in, but in the UK, um, you're not allowed to park uh, uh, up by the side of the motorway unless it's an absolute emergency and this anecdote uh, from this guy there who finally uh, was convinced having just seen the data and couldn't find any flaw in it um he, he said that um well uh, uh, you know um uh, this anecdote made me think that one of the reasons you're probably banned from st standing on the side of the motorway is it's possibly toxic levels of carbon monoxide um so that is real food for thought. Um, yeah, and also, of course, there were leaded fuels back then. And so maybe that's possibly why a lot of our generation are, are um, how should we put this, uh, mentally challenged. <laughs> possibly, I don't know. Um, but really, uh, if you see a generator right next to a bouncy castle and the next fair you take your kids to, <laughs> I'd steer clear. <laughs> Go to some something else that, <laughs> you know, as much as they k scream at you, they, they shouldn't be breathing that in. Okay, so uh, this is a huge win. If we can reduce these 30,000 deaths alone, it's going to be massive. And um, uh, good things are afoot in terms of uh, taking this forward. Um, I think you're gonna. Uh, I think the the patent um, version of the generator will be submitted tomorrow, which means um, that the people in the MFMP that are expecting devices or rather thunderstorm generators for their own testing, um, they should be uh, rolling out after that, uh, which is good. So. Um, I'm I'm very excited about that. So um, now, where the title of this presentation is kind of like how how are we getting these kind of readings? This kind of uh, O2, which should possibly be down at zero, but certainly uh, one or two percent. Uh, you know, you don't really expect more than that coming out of uh, an engine's exhaust, um, and you know, how, how are we actually losing CO2? You know, the one reservation I have is it's something to do with flow rate and, and is the water being split and then you're getting extra oxygen coming out and, and so how, so it's a kind of diluting the stream. I don't know, but whatever. The, the carbon monoxide has to be a real thing from my point of view because I was in that building for a good portion of the day and there wasn't a twinge of a headache or nausea or or being dead. Um, so you know th th this it's definitely worth uh, pursuing further. Okay, so um, where I'm going with this is that possibly one of the reasons that uh, we are um, not seeing the kind of um, carbon potentially that should be there is I've already said that you know carbon and oxygen fuse to silicon and we can look at the work of Bokras and Sonderason uh, that showed that um, and also uh, at least their concept of it and also the uh, Srinivasan work the synthesis of an extra three tons of silicon and one ton of iron per day for 11 weeks continuous in a carbon arc furnace in Coimbatore in India. Um, that would certainly uh, indicate that the elements can be sequestered. I actually said to Malcolm, something, it was actually something that was suggested by one person in the community, why didn't you just feed extra CO2 into the carburetor and, and you, you know, get paid for carbon sequ sequestration? Okay, so like, you know, it's plant food, so all these things uh, should be considered in uh, moderation. Anyway, um, the Botcris work I first talked about in, I think it was the 2016 presentation I gave, 
in January. In, we're using this slide actually in uh, California, um, the Stanford Energy Club. And this was the reaction they proposed. 2 carbon-12 plus 2 oxygen-18 goes to iron-56 and helium-4. And I talked about this George Osor cycle. This is the extended diagram. And essentially, um, you've got carbon and nitrogen here. They can fuse uh, to aluminium. Nitrogen and oxygen fuse to phosphorus. Uh, carbon and oxygen here, you've got silicon down there. Nitrogen and nitrogen can go to silicon. Uh, and then you can get these other elements which we seem to see in these systems. So silicon and oxygen fuse to titanium, which we observed. Uh, two carbons fuse to magnesium, and you put another oxygen on there, and you end up with calcium, which we observed. Uh, two oxygens fuse to sulfur, which we observed in the analysis of the inside of the outside of the 24-inch sphere of the thunderstorm generator. But what I have thought about recently is that absolutely none of these detectors, whilst they are testing for NOx, none of them are testing for nitrogen. None of them are testing for nitrogen. Well, what's special about nitrogen? Well, nitrogen is 78% of the air we breathe. But interestingly, of the NOx products that are toxic, uh, not nitrous oxide, uh, uh, some people might think that's toxic in large volumes, but anyway, um, nitric oxide, uh, this is the product that comes out of the little blue pill and gives everyone a hard time, um, it's not as no noxious as uh, nitrogen dioxide, and these things can both end up uh, forming uh, nitric acid and not good for breathing. Uh, anyway, the point being is that the bond energies of nitrogen dioxide and nitric oxide are lower than nitrogen, okay? Um, and so this means that nitrogen is the strongest bond followed by nitric oxide and then nitrogen nitrogen dioxide and this is consistent with the fact that N2 has a triple bond it has three bonds between each of the uh, nitrogen atoms uh, nitri nitric oxide has a double bond and there's kind of this resonance uh, single and double bond in nitrogen dioxide and what I'm suggesting here is that if you end up producing nitrogen uh, in a system that's constantly recycling the material in this kind of uh, toroidal vortex structures, then maybe once nitrogen is made, because nitrogen it, itself is diamagnetic, when it's synthesized, it might be ejected. The other thing about nitrogen is it's very un unreactive, you know, you... You put things in nitrogen so that they uh, don't oxidize or whatever. You, you, you often get um, you know, things you want to store in nitrogen. Um, the other thing that I found from the Russian community, I have to give them credit this week, there was a, a guy in the last week who was giving a presentation which is very lengthy. It had some interesting things about the history of Lena, which I did not know about, and so it's going to take a lot of work. And in fact, what I might do is produce an educational set of videos on translating documents. And then I might ask some of you guys to join me in the process of translating some of these documents so that we can get a larger throughput of materials coming from other language spaces so that we can get cro better cross-pollination. Um, the tools are getting very effective now, and there are many of you out there that I believe are you know, that you have enough understanding of this field where you can correct where the translation is going wrong. And so um, I'd really appreciate if people could reach out to me and, and maybe uh, say, yep, yeah, that's something I, I think I can do and I'd like to do it. And, and that would really uh, help the community moving forward. But anyway, what I learned from this uh, presentation on last Wednesday, or the Wednesday before, no, last Wednesday, I think it was last Wednesday, that nitrogen-14 is the heaviest odd odd 
long-term stable isotope. That blew me away. Why did I not know that? Like, why did I not know that? Of course, you've got deuterium, which is paramagnetic in a monoatomic form or D form, like the actual deuteron itself. Otherwise, it's diamagnetic as a molecule. Lithium-6 is paramagnetic. And boron-10, boron, which we observed in the uh, Yang side of a ultra experiment, if you recall, those boron crystals, that is diamagnetic. And uh, I've just noted the fact that we observed it there in that ultra experiment. So the interesting thing is, it, you know, is this significant? I just, I, I was actually blown away that there are actually only four stable odd, odd nuclei in the periodic table. There we go. And uh, yeah, if you, if you want to know, like, if you go to the um, MFMP's Philip Power programmed system, and I can show you here now how you can see this. Um, let me do that. Because we'll, we'll be needing to look at this anyway later. I'm going to blow it up a bit. Okay. Right. If you go to the tab show element data here, and I'm going to blow it up a bit more, okay? And so if we go to, uh, how should we put this? Deuteron. Uh, so we've got hydrogen here. So you can see a deuteron, it has um, one and then two. So that's odd, odd. One, one, one neutron, sorry, one proton and, and one additional neutron. We go to, um, obviously to have odd numbers of protons, we have to go to uh, an odd number here. So three lithium here. Um, so six lithium here is Z3 and a six that gives us a um, odd odd then we have boron here with your five protons and five neutrons boron 10 and then nitrogen you have uh, seven and 14 now for the rest of the odd uh, z numbers if the a is um how should we put this? If it if it's odd, then it means there's a an even number of uh, a, a neutrons. So if I go to fluorine, for instance, uh, we have that's nine nine away from that. That gives you ten, and literally you can do this through the entire periodic table, and it is correct. Um, there is something that I have learnt uh, this week which I didn't know before, and that is the um, nitrogen 14 is the heaviest long-term stable element and the way you can see stability here is um, you know there's no decay mode so if I go to I don't know something that might have uh, some decay uh, let's go to calcium here so calcium you can see electron capture there so uh, but that's not odd uh, Anyway, you get the idea. Right, so nitrogen is, you know, it is special. Um, not the most amazing thing, uh, but maybe it is. Okay, so um, this is where I want to talk about um, something which is kind of assumed that we all know. And I want to do a, a test as to whether this is actually how it all is. And that is um, making carbon-14. The conventional wisdom is that cosmic rays uh, produce high-energy neutrons in the upper atmosphere. And these collide with nitrogen-14, which is definitely in the upper atmosphere, converting it into carbon-14 and a proton. Okay, So ignore these two points here. They're not really relevant. That was from my commentary earlier. Carbon-14 decays to nitrogen-14, and this is the basis of radiocarbon dating. 
uh, because this decay process normally happens uh, the half-life is around 5,700 years plus or minus 30 years. Now, does anyone know where I'm going with this? Does anyone know why I'm telling you about carbon-14? Going back to the Sundaresan and Bokris, uh, I talked about how um, potentially, uh, if this does get confirmed later down the line, um, that Binjun Huang is producing 17 oxygen uh, from this relic neutrino interaction in this little black box whatever that is we might have an idea of what that is but anyway effectively all of these four particles come together uh, because of the relic neutrinos de Broglie wavelength and uh, it's a net positive reaction that produces this 17 oxygen um, and I talked about how if this same kind of reaction here then led to 12 carbon and 22 neon as it would appear would that explain the Sundaresan and Bokris uh, reaction instead of what they proposed, which is 2 carbon-12 and 2 oxygen-18, which is the rare isotope uh, of oxygen, not as rare as 17 oxygen, but it's still rare. I propose that this 17 oxygen, 17 oxygen, 4 17 oxygens go to 12 carbon and iron-56, which had about the same energy. Okay, well... Um, just going to go through these kind of slides that we've talked about in the past where we have the iron and oxygen and the silicon and oxygen on the outside. This is silicon and oxygen. This is iron and oxygen. This is in the Allen Goldwater replication of the um, Ultra experiment. A little bit more detail here on the ball lightning breakup in... Um, Henk Uren's Vega Valley experiment and you can see in the core we have iron oxide uh, of some type and the blue areas are here a little bit further out are the silicon oxide and here we have calcium oxide even further out than that and that these are the major spectrum components of the only spectrum captured of a uh, a supposed natural ball lightning and it's always been the assumption on my part to a degree that the nitrogen and oxygen here are just because there's nitrogen and oxygen in the air okay it's not that they're synthesized it's that they're already there the silicon could be synthesized um, and the iron could be synthesized like Bokris and Sundaresan and the silicon and iron here could be synthesized um, such as the uh, Coimbatore reactor of Mahadevan Srinivasan. Um, now, when we go in and look at this closer, what we notice is this equatorial uh, area of carbon-rich accretion. And these balls typically end up, you know, totally free of any other detritus. But in the ones which we've seen in many examples in the Vega Valley, they have this orbiting around the equatorial plane of carbon and other materials. So these bits here are likely pieces of copper. And we, we've got other elements you typically see in that George Oshawa reaction tree. So it's almost like it's a accretion disk around a black hole. Um, that you see when these things finally break up. In the case of Mahadev and Srinivasan, this is again carbon here, uh, the carbon arc. And so, whilst carbon is diamagnetic, if you um, and you know silicon and stuff, whilst these things may be diamagnetic, when you throw an intense electric current through them, discharge, you're going to ionize them. Maybe they have an unpaired electron and then they can be captured into this structure the, the, that we talk about, these magnetohydrodynamic structures. Uh, the magnetohydrodynamic structure itself is, you know, it has these charge separation that's sufficient to uh, ionize material anyway, but it needs to get close. If you're already magnetic, you're wanting to get in there. And so in this case... Um, 
There was uh, silicon synthesized to the tune of three tons and iron was synthesized to the tune of one ton. And it would always seem in their understanding that oxygen is critical. With my theory, oxygen is critical, except oxygen 17 is synthesized first. Um, I'm, I, I'm not averse to this either, but the carbon has to be uh, ionized and it's going to be ionized when it's in this scenario. Okay. So why am I going on about this? Well, Malcolm Bendel's system we found had the iron-rich crenelated spheres. And uh, you can see that there's some boron there. So we talked about how the boron is one of the only stable um, diamagnetic uh, odd-odd isotopes. It would be interesting to find out if that boron is predominantly boron-10. We know you know, that if you look at the ratio of boron-10, if we go to natural boron, um, natural boron here is mostly um, boron-11, okay? So it doesn't really like to produce boron-10. So it would be interesting to find out if boron synthesized, say, in an ultra experiment, actually has a non-natural isotope ratio. Um so that's one thing. And we also have nitrogen here on the outside. Of course, nitrogen's in the reactor, so it's not unsurprising. And the other, other elements here. Okay, so in this particular example, on the background here, we have sulfur and calcium. In fact, someone pointed out that this is pretty, pretty much calcium sulfate. And one wonders, you know, this is essentially gypsum. One wonders how gypsum actually forms in nature. Does it actually form because of these kind of processes going on? Maybe, don't know. Um, but anyway, that's got calcium, sulfur, and oxygen in there. Is it due to sulfur? I don't know, in the in, in the um, fuel itself? Or is it fusion of uh, two oxygens together to make sulfur? Don't know. These things are things that will come out of the wash eventually, I imagine. And again, you have the spheres at regular distances with the carbon accretion around the outside. And I've actually overlaid the sacred geometry structure on here, and the spacing is quite appropriate when you line up the hexagon structure that's here. Um, so I think this is similar to what we've seen in the Henk urine system, but the Henk urine is a specific ball lightning that just blew up. So. I am going to promote, thank you, uh, Beneficence uh, TV, that's very kind of you. Um, so the what I'm considering, potentially, and the point of what I'm saying here is that potentially you could have a scenario where the hydrogen from the water that's being added in that bubbler the hydrogen from the water that's being added from that bubbler. So if you get water going and hitting iron, and I think if iron's over 600 degrees centigrade, it can thermocatalytically split water into hydrogen and oxygen. And, you know, when you split things, they don't always go, uh, you know, uh, they can be heterogeneously split. So you can have some protons, some atomic hydrogen, and, and various different radicals uh, going on in there. What, whether you've got a single proton or you've got an atomic hydrogen, that's a proton with an electron. These things, both of them, we identified have a magnetic moment. The the atomic hydrogen is a slightly higher magnetic moment than the proton. And of course, you've got the oxygen. The oxygen is so reactive. Either the oxygen that's coming in with the air or the oxygen, that particular oxygen itself is possibly going to fuse with another oxygen. It doesn't matter if it's... Uh, uh, atomic oxygen, uh, molecular oxygen, or ozone, they are all, unlike in the case of nitrogen and carbon, they are all uh, paramagnetic. Obviously, oxygen is the most paramagnetic. And so that can be swept into these magnetohydrodynamic structures. And you have, um, let's say, you've got the, the protons or the atomic hydrogen, and they're going in there could they fuse with 12 carbon, uh, either like one proton, one electron, uh, one synthesized antineutrino, uh, and uh, the 12 carbon 
to make 13 carbon, but if if you add that's like that's a, a neutron but going in there, but if you add a proton at the same time, so you've got two of the protons going in um, from the split water, you could directly synthesize 14 nitrogen. And because 14 nitrogen is very stable, uh, this odd odd isotope, it could get thrown out. And if it gets formed into nitrogen um, gas, then that is diamagnetic and it would not like to want to go back in the process, unlike oxygen. Okay. You could have a scenario, potentially, where, and, and actually, the, the part of the, um, how should we put this, the, the, it's, it's not, it's not exactly the same thing because there's no gammas coming out, and if there is gammas coming out, we don't see them. But there is a thing called the, uh, car, uh, the CNO cycle, which we've talked about before. Uh, okay, here. Honestly, where is it? There. <laughs> okay. And here it is. Uh, we've talked about it before. But in this case, the proton comes in and a gamma comes out. We end up going to uh, 13 nitrogen. And that decays from 13 nitrogen with a positron and a neutrino to 13 carbon. Another proton comes in with a gamma coming out and you get 14 nitrogen. So 12 carbon is... Uh, stable, 14 nitrogen stable, continue on the process, you get 15 nitrogen. And in nature, you see 14 nitrogen stable, 15 nitrogen stable. This is a much lower amount of this material here. So uh, what I'm suggesting is effectively, we go straight from this point to this point, um, but we don't have the gammas and we don't have the positrons. So we don't end up with the production of... Um, a, how should we put this, uh, uh, the two 511 kV uh, annihilation gammas from a positron and an electron. And so we don't see these things. So maybe it is going all together inside the phase singularity with the neutrinos and so forth, uh, going straight from 12 carbon to 14 nitrogen. Or what might be happening is that you end up with um, two protons, two electrons, two antineutrinos, and a 112 carbon simultaneously fusing to 14 carbon. And we know that Lena typically does not produce radioactive isotopes with the exclusion of tritium. But could it be the case that there is such a flux of this going through the core that some small quantity of carbon-14 is emitted. The vast majority, if it would go to carbon-14, would immediately decay within this system to uh, nitrogen-14. So either there's the direct path to nitrogen-14, or it, it steps over to carbon-14, but because this remediates stuff immediately, it basically goes to uh, nitrogen-14 almost instantaneously. But could it be that some carbon-14 is synthesized and happens to not get captured in the system and remediated. And why am I saying this? I'm saying this because, one, if this is true, then it would be a completely different mechanism for the synthesis of natural carbon-14 than the one that is generally accepted as high incident um, cosmic rays uh, reaction, which I discussed earlier. And the second point is that we are using so-called fossil fuels. And, and fossil fuels shouldn't have any carbon-14 in them, should they? Uh, they shouldn't have any in at all because they are... Uh, fossil fuels and that 5,700 plus or minus 30 year half-life will have been exceeded by the many millions of years that the fossil fuels have been sitting there being fossils and so what I am proposing to do is to scrape off some of the deposited material 
so if we go back to this image here, this material all around here is this carbon accretion. And this carbon accretion, I would assume or, or suggest to you, is possibly the carbon that's captured from the um, hydrocarbon. But it may be that some of this is carbon-14. And if that's the case, we can put that on the beam line in Finland and detect the ratio of carbon-14. If the carbon-14 ratio is above one part per trillion, then one might consider that this is synthesizing carbon-14. It doesn't actually matter how much it is. It, it, it only needs to be diddly squat above absolutely nothing. And then you've got to start considering that then this might be the process that is occurring. So could we be at a point of um, finding that there is a wholly different way that carbon-14 is made in the atmosphere? So uh, I understand that um, Malcolm is willing to have me do this test. Uh, so I need to arrange with the beamline to... Um, do it. I already have the sample to do it. And um, uh, that is basically what I wanted to say today. Essentially, what I'm saying is why we may be seeing the um, lack of carbon monoxide here. Um, this lack of carbon monoxide and this lack of carbon dioxide, we know it seems to be, well, it seems to be creating the iron-rich crenellated spheres. It seems to be creating um, other elements that would require synthesis, uh, fusing of these elements. But could it be that the most abundant gas in the atmosphere, nitrogen, um, could be synthesized in this same process? And I argue that the crust is produced by Lena is the answer to the what Lena can do and I've suggested in the past that the atmosphere is also a product of Lena and could it be that nitrogen <clears throat> is part of that story in in a big way mostly I've talked about oxygen and, and hydrogen um, so th that is my hypothesis and if more nitrogen is being formed in these systems, this system and this system and all of the other systems that I've been seeing used to test this are not detecting nitrogen. And moreover, as I showed you here, nitrogen has the strongest bond and is um, diamagnetic. Okay? And maybe something to do with its special status as the heaviest odd-odd nuclei is causing this. Um, we have known for a long time that we see these kind of products. Strangely enough, we don't see scandium. Uh, I'm sure there's a, a reason for that um, over here. But the other products we tend to, not so much phosphorus because it's got a very low boiling point, um, but we have seen it. But I think there's something to be said that if nitrogen was synthesized in this system, it would go out because it's highly diamagnetic and because it's highly unreactive and highly stable. It's going to be um, thrown to the outside of the structure and um, uh, produced, as it were. And so I, I'm looking forward to see if, if Alan Goldwater gets one of these devices, will he see an increase in nitrogen? because uh, we have the cirrus um, process mass, gas mass spectrometry, which can look at high resolution in these ranges. Uh, Nikita has also got a mass spectrometer, so I'm really looking for these kind of things. They may see a, an increase, for instance, of heavy, heavy carbon dioxide if there's a lot more um, carbon-14 O2 being produced rather than carbon 12 
O2. So that that would be something I would look out. Maybe there's some cross talks with other things. Probably is, unfortunately. Um, but that is kind of what I wanted to say today. So if you've got any questions, uh, fire away. Uh, so three says, Bob, the pattern on the sphere would, I can't read your thing, uh, would you say that it's a form of reaction diffusion? Uh, do you mean on the crenellated uh, spheres? Or do you mean on the, the um, do you mean on the actual hexagonal and pentagonal structures that are on the sphere? Uh, sorry, yes to which one? <laughs> The crenellated spheres. No, um, let's let's go back to that. Um, the crenellated spheres, in my view, are that you get a coherent matter layer, which you can see here on this broken one, and you saw the same thing on the toroidal one on the boundary of the 15 millimeter ball lightning cut. So this is the coherent layer on this part, and then I kind of think that these crenellations are actual similar self-similar quanta that are kind of coming down and joining onto the surface, if you know what I mean. Um, they are uh, like, it's a ball lightning, one big ball lightning, but it's kind of skinned with little ball lightning. And I was kind of trying to draw this with the patch that I was doing in the, the previous presentation, if, if you remember, um, or a, a recent presentation. So the the reason I say this is actually if we go to that recent presentation, um, let me go there. Uh, that's the flower of life one. Um, so here, um, what I've noticed is around the coherent layer, this edge here. There's this fuzziness. There's a fuzziness around the outside often, this fuzziness. And um, when it's uh, showing me the right thing, around the outside of this ball lightning cut, at this point, we have these uh, two, three, four, five, six, eight structures all the way around there. And I think that if they come in and bind to this ball lightning structure, if this maintained itself in this point, then they would move around with it. And, and it kind of explains to me the um, the observation of Leonid Oritzkev when he's exploding titanium foils in, in water in the early 2000s. And he saw a ball lightning form above pretty much every time or many times. And then that would decay into lots of little ball lightning. So effectively, you've got one sphere that's holding a lot of self-similar quanta on its surface because these things can interact with their own toroidal moments, but um, that's the only thing that likes to interact with these things. They're kind of bound on the surface, and then the whole thing, like the, the inside coherent breaks down and the little ball lightnings come away. And this would also explain things like the... And it might be some of the energy from that coherent matter gets absorbed into the subquanta, the self-similar subquanta. So that's kind of where I was going um, with my explanation on these these things. That um, you know this this structure here, which is a stable hexagonal structure or the pentagonal one, because the the vortex goes into the core of the subquanta. This whole thing would be stuck on the outside, but when the overall structure um, starts to decay, they kind of like uh, they share their energy around, and 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 you end up with the crenellations. It's, it's one hypothesis I have for explaining the crenellations on the surface. It's open to review. Um, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, so Do Gordon Doherty says, yeah, like the sun. Yeah, I, I imagine the sun is like one big ball lightning. On the outside, there's lots of little ball lightnings. And uh, it's, you know, you could argue um, that the whole universe is made of different levels of these toroidal structures and interacting on different levels. 
and the the sun is is kind of like planet earth and on planet earth it's like one big exotic vacuum object and we are little exotic vacuum object structures moving around on the surface and on the sun it's just these unit cells that move around um could there be a walkthrough of the paper that was just released? Yeah, so um, what's actually happening is, uh, um, I, I assume you're talking about the uh, gases from cavitation. This Wednesday, the Russian community are going to do a deep dive into it. Um, I know Alexander Parkamov, I've been working with him a lot this week and with Binger and Huang. Um, uh, Alexander Parkamov has... Um, suggested that two nitrogens might fuse to make carbon and oxygen, and there's a, a higher yield than the proposed 17 oxygen, 17 oxygen, uh, leading to car 12 carbon and neon 22. That is true, but uh, my view on that is uh, all of these other pieces of data that point to uh, nitrogen not playing a role. And one of the most important ones is, in fact, I completely missed this, uh, the Sundaresan and Bokris work, um, basically in, in the Sundaresan and Bokris work, if I go to that, um, they, well, essentially, they if when they degassed the water and they saturated it with nitrogen, they saw zero synthesis of iron. When they degassed the water by boiling it and saturated it with the oxygen, they saw the production of iron. Um Here's, here's an interesting thing. This is actually the paper, I'm gonna, we, I think we should look at this, that was for ball lightning itself. Um, and I was talking about how uh, nitrogen, it might be a fuel, but um, what you can see here in the spectrum over time is that right at the beginning, you only have the silicon, iron and calcium peaks. And I would argue that this is the core of ball lightning, um, which we see uh, here. That's that's the silicon, iron, and calcium peaks. This is the core with the bulk of the material being iron and oxygen, silicon and oxygen, and calcium and oxygen. So the, these are the elements you see here. And this would be the core. And around that, you have a proportion of the environment which is nitrogen and oxygen and they are maybe synthesizing more of the same of these elements uh, because we know silicon is formed and iron is formed uh, from this um, fusion of uh, uh, the other elements um, and uh, <clears throat> that is the core and then it actually says in the paper that when it's at its brightest, you are getting the spectrum of uh, nitrogen and oxygen. And that might be because, you know, before it's become maybe a, like totally coherent or something, uh, at that point, maybe w when it's really spun up, it has sucked in some oxygen and nitrogen from the environment. They're converted into ions. The ions are emitting their spectral lines. And so you see those. But you can see down here um, at the 1,114 millisecond line, the last line to exist here is actually the silicon. And there was this talk about the early 2000s Abrahams and De Dennis model. I think it was in 2000 uh, that that was proposed. And they proposed that the, the cloud to ground discharge went into soil and it basically ionized silicon from the soil and carbon from the soil this came up as a toroidal cluster and it was just oxidizing the silicon and oxidizing the iron this is prior to the observation of this that led to the long-lived glowing effect um that doesn't um account for i mean obviously there's calcium in the ground as well and they could replicate those things but um you know, it counts for some things. We, we, we have to admit that it counts for some things. Um, but I, I, I think we can learn something from the progression of how at the beginning at 642 milliseconds, there is zero oxygen and nitrogen here. 
in the spectrum. And then that comes in and that comes in and it gets brighter and brighter up to the, I think it's the 647 point here, which they've got here. This is the brightest point, 647.684 milliseconds. That's the brightest point. And then when once it's got brightest, I would suggest that that's probably when it's actually at the coherent on the boundary stage and it can't take anything more in. And, and so the whole thing is decaying down. Um, and the last thing to see is silicon and silicon if we go back to our George Osawa reaction tree uh, from the presentation here the uh, silicon can be produced in a number of ways one is from nitrogen and nitrogen going to silicon and um, the other one is where is it somewhere else have we got somewhere else or is that the end? no carbon and oxygen going to silicon now we don't really have a lot of carbon in the environment, so it's probably the nitrogen and nitrogen in the environment. So um, we have all this nitrogen beam uh, here, and we know that the oxygen is is key to going in and uh, forming the silicon dioxide, forming the calcium dioxides, and forming the iron oxides. So the the, the nitrogen might be going in and uh, fusing to uh, silicon in this instance okay okay see if uh, who else has got a question uh so elliot's saying uh comments are getting censored um i have to say that yes it is true that um comments are not only getting censored on our channel but people are reporting that they cannot post our videos on other channels um, I've, I'm afraid probably we need to accept now that the only way to share this information currently is through X until the European Union invoke their law next month I think it's next month to try and uh, censor X um, when it might become more difficult there and then we'll be down to um, looking at remote view and then it's a case of um, they are starting to try and attack uh, um, Substack um, as all of these different laws to prevent information that's inconvenient becoming public are put into place in the coming year. Okay, I'm going to look uh, up through to see the questions here. I'll do a separate video on the Cosmic Summit. Um, I need to actually subscribe. There's a, there's a way that um, I can get supported to go and give my presentations there. There's a, a small proportion of the these the um, conference fee I will get, but I I have to actually sign up and 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 put a um, get a referral code. So if anyone's interested in meeting me there and uh, um, you know hearing what I have to say in person, then that would be great. Um, I'll let you know. So yeah, what what so the, about the paper that's just been released? Um, uh, I will publish the Russian community presentation that is uh, uh, going to come either this coming Wednesday or the following Wednesday, um, and that will be. I know it's very thorough because uh, I we've had many many questions, and uh, I've worked with Bin to um, resolve those, and the raw data is expected to be made public in the coming days as well for those that wanted that as well. Um, James Vickers is asking about the R process. Yeah, there's several processes which the different sons of different scales uh, do their nuclear processing. Um, I'm not so sure that, uh, that that they are they work in those ways, but um, uh, you know um, <laughs> maybe. Um, but the what we tend to see in Lena is both heavier and lighter elements being uh, synthesized at the same time, and so 
right? it, these stepwise things that always seem to add mass don't seem to follow what you see in Lena, and and possibly that's going on it, on Suns, but you don't see that in aggregate. You just see the thing slowly <laughs> getting denser and denser, and so the assumption is that it must be pr proceeding in this one particle interacts with the overall mass, then one particle interacts with the overall mass, rather than things that can uh, do many, many interactions simultaneously. Some great conversations. It's real, really good to see you guys uh, getting into it. And, and and anyone who's watching this video later, I highly recommend you engage with the chat. You will need to subscribe to the channel three hours before in order to interact with the live chat. But there are quite a few people now. Um, you know, Gordon and and uh, Artifact and Dan Moretti and. Uh, uh, Corky that have a great history uh, uh, in their own understanding and they've seen me blather for long enough to almost act as surrogates in a way uh, so you can have conversations with them <laughs> whilst I'm blathering on about things or trying to find something that I need to say so Paul, Paul O'Neill said he nearly choked on one of those blue pills and had a stiff neck all night <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> thanks for the thanks for the warning. <laughs> uh William Schwantz says he uses nitrous in his race cars. Yes, great. <laughs> Estonia says we can always add CO2 to the atmosphere. Yes, yes. Um, we can probably quite easily add a lot of CO2 if we need to. William Schwantz says he got carbon monoxide poisoned in his house and my dog had a seizure like four months ago. Uh, broken heating unit in my house. Well, I would recommend very inexpensive carbon monoxide detector to have by your furnace, your uh, gas boiler, whatever it is. Um, even maybe in your kitchen. Um, uh, really, this is a very toxic gas. Yeah, Space Case says newer devices often have their own sensor. Where is it? That terrible statistic of... Uh, where is it? Three... 30,000 people every year, approximately. So exotic propulsion, welcome. Glad to see the thunderstorm getting so much attention. Uh, the way I look at it, that um, unfortunately, I keep saying this to Malcolm, every time I've looked a little bit further at the system, uh, it looks like it's delivering what was expected. Um, I am hoping beyond hope, really, that <laughs> there will be some carbon-14 in the uh, accretion disks of these spheres. If, is, if that is the case, it, it upends a huge... Um, understanding of um, carbon dating where the carbon is coming from and why uh, it's going to completely revolution a whole other area of science or it could be just rubbish and uh, uh, you know the beam line will say and since um, you know it shouldn't have any carbon 14 in it because it's fossil fuel it should be fairly determinative and because I've only got some samples and Malcolm can chuck out as many samples as he likes, um, 
because uh, he's got a large sphere uh, it can be tested by third parties anyway so it, it wouldn't just be my word for it or the the beamline people's word for it when they come back and say it's all 12 carbon 12 they go okay all right fine <laughs> Fasted is asking, what's the scientific consensus on fusion in pistol shrimp and mantis shrimp via cavitation? They seem willing to admit shrimp, uh, admit uh, shrimps, but humans cannot. Well, maybe. Um, I don't know. It, it, it depends. I mean, th th mostly they say there's a shock wave and that stuns the prey. Uh, do you know if the generator runs rich or lean or if it changes while the tech uh, is and isn't attached? Okay, so I I have some reservations on the loading. I've seen things being loaded. You've seen things being loaded on there. Um, but the, the, the devices that I have seen so far have been very much prototypes. There's a long way to go. Um, there's another video that I will do... Uh, and I will first ask some questions of the community. Uh, and I'll probably do that in a, in a blog. And I'll ask you to go away and look at a few questions. And then uh, we'll have a convening session uh, once once you've answered those questions for yourself. Uh, I think that's probably the best way to do this particular thing. And so I might do that next week with regard to the whole loading aspect um like i say with with this particular test of a modified and unmodified reactor i became totally satisfied that uh, certainly the emissions on an unloaded device were uh reduced and even on the loaded generator you didn't see more than about 300 and something and that is exactly what the independent testers tested on the 18th of January this past week. So uh, there we go, 361. So this is kind of the amount that I would see on a loaded generator with that handheld device. Yes, uh, Elliot's uh, confirming to Fast Ed that the cavitation is the same cavitation you can generate with uh, high frequency sound. To a degree, I actually think the cavitation is better when you have resonance because if you've got a high Q, then uh, the the energy concentration can build and build and build at the point of resonance. Whereas a pistol shrimp is more about the shock wave from the reentrant jet. So a lot of people focus on the reentrant jet. I'm more focused on the complex current structures that's caused by things like hydrophilic driven uh, easy water and multi-axis shear leading to the uh, fractal toroidal current structures that are able to do some magic. And then if that can build a... Um, localized point vacuum current that builds and builds and builds and builds and like an anti version of that then maybe that's why we get um stuff uh you know mm, synthesizing and desynthesizing uh the the tune the uh, tune pieces has joined us and uh, we're going to be finishing so shortly so <clears throat> yeah uh, Dan Retty is right that the, the stream is winding down. So I'll just do a quick review in a second. Uh, Steve Tippett, uh, I can't wait to see how this plays out. I, I agree with you entirely. Um, it would be rude not to do this test. I have the material. It's not that pri It is quite pricey, but it's not that pricey to do the beam line. I think it's... Uh, the last time I looked, it was about 400 a sample. So... I would do, 
you know, a, cu a couple of samples um, initially. Uh, exotic propulsion. If you are uh, doing stuff with uranium ore, uh, please uh, take all proportions so that you don't ingest any of it. Okay. Breathe it in, whatever. Uh, so, Lithnik, the pattern is asking, is there any update on when you're getting your engines? We're not getting engines. We're getting the modification kit to the generators. Um, uh, the kind of things that you will see. <clears throat> okay. And uh, the patent, as I understand it, will be delivered to the patent office, the application. And then after that, the, the versions that have been built can be sent out to the uh, people doing the ex uh, independent experiments. Okay, so I'm just going to do a quick review. Um, this was Thor Howe. And I was asking, how do we get these NOx figures so low and the lack of carbon monoxide and the lack of carbon dioxide? And where is this oxygen coming from? Is it really being synthesized, which we have proposed there is a path to synthesis of, car uh, of oxygen? Or is it kind of left over because the hydrogens are used from the split water and so you end up with oxygen coming out? Um, uh, that might be one way. You, ha you produce an excess oxygen because you're, you're, you're es essentially sequestering the hydrogen into the carbon to make nitrogen, uh, not just oxygen. So that might be something that occurs and that's really the thrust of this presentation. So what you're seeing there in that particular slide is something that is less than half of the Euro 6 2014 specification for NOx from petrol cars and uh, these were the equipment that was used on the 18th of this month uh, these are the control gases and so forth this is some of the equipment and this was the device that I used uh, myself to do tests and it looks for hydrogen sulfide uh, carbon monoxide, uh, total combustible gases percent, and oxygen in the air. Um, this doesn't look for H2S, but it looks to, for SO2. In fact, it might have other things down there. It's just what I'm seeing on the table right now. Um, and it's looking for NOx. But what I found was in a idling device, I could only see a top level of 197, uh, zero H2S zero combustible gases it would appear that would imply that there is no hydrogen coming out of here or that this detector cannot detect the hydrogen as a combustible gas in i mean this is a few inches away from the exhaust in the case of the unmodified honda 550 uh, there was two parts per million of hydrogen h2s and uh, 10 is a danger limit there we don't know what this is because it, it went over limit because it goes over 500. And so it goes over limit. And the reality is that using other devices that can measure up to 10,000 parts per million, that's like 1%, that goes over limit. And sometimes the output from an engine like that can be 3% carbon monoxide. And that is very, very quickly fatal. Um, and indeed... 30,000 people or so die every year from carbon monoxide poisoning and Honda states three times in their instruction manuals for these devices uh, in prominent places and in bold and in boxes uh, that these generators must be 25 feet away or more and given where I've seen these generators in the past it's, it's appalling um, that this is not better understood and I, I, I feel ashamed that I did not understand this. This should be basic education of that everyone has to have before they're even allowed to buy a generator of that type. Um, so we talked about the ball lightning uh, reaction tree, the CNO um, <clears throat> fusion tree of George Oshawa, and how that played into the Sundras and, and Bokris work. But the main point of about today is none of the meters are testing for actually uh, nitrogen, uh, and specifically nitrogen in the form of molecular nitrogen N2 
Why is it special? It's most of the air we breathe and nitrogen itself actually has a higher bond energy than the NOx dangerous products and this means it has the strongest bond. So if we actually form nitrogen, um, it's got a stronger, you have to work harder to get it apart than you do these. So if you've got materials going around and around as soon as the nitrogen synthesized in my view because it's diamagnetic it will get kicked out kicked out of the system this highly magnetic system and it won't be pulled back in there because it doesn't have a magnetic moment okay um, uh, and it's unreactive uh, and just as an aside whether it's relevant I don't know but I learned this week that nitrogen 14 is the heaviest odd odd long-term stable isotope there's nothing else beyond that and uh, uh, boron 10 which we've seen synthesized in both the it would appear boron has been synthesized in both an ultra experiment and in the um, thunderstorm generator uh, so maybe there's something to this that diamagnetic odd odd for some reason come out um, so the traditional thinking about how carbon-14 is made is that cosmic rays produce high-energy neutrons that collide with nitrogen-14, converting it into carbon-14 and a proton. Uh, and the carbon-14 decays to nitrogen-14, and this is the basis of carbon dating, which has a half-life of 5,700 plus or minus 30 years. I talked about the revisiting of Sundresen and Bokris and how a similar reaction here, producing 17 on oxygen, uh, and the sulfatin oxygens coming together, as in the Bin Zhen Huang work, um, could uh, uh, explain the synthesis of iron. And what I'm really referring to is this process here of many particles coming together with oxygen uh, uh, under the de Broglie wavelength of the antineutrino to synthesize a heavier isotope. And kind of what I'm proposing is that you actually have here the 12 carbon. Uh, so that it's ionized and it goes into the system you have two antineutrinos two electrons and two protons and that goes all the way through to carbon 14 which most of it immediately decays to uh, nitrogen 14 or one proton one electron one antineutrino one carbon 12 and a, uh, uh, a proton come together to make nitrogen uh, 14 directly either way um, and we talked about the ball lightning we've only really ever focused on the synthesis of the silicon and the calcium and the iron uh, and that this hangs around in the original paper the, the these products are all there from the beginning of the observation of the ball lightning and it's only these products that get uh, brighter and brighter and then decay away and I suggest that's because the nascent ball lightning still has its magnetic core which this is the structure broken up and it pulls in atmospheric air those get ionized uh, and then they form the nitrogen forms silicon and the silicon two silicons come together essentially to make iron 54 um, and uh, so forth and in the oxygen oxides and everything else basically comes out of the fusion of these things and the last things to basically be around is silicon which is the, <clears throat> the fusion of two nitrogens uh, and so what you observe in that paper which if we go to it here just the magnetic core the pulling in of the um, atmospheric air into the ball lightning structure the brightest part here at 647 where the spectrum lines here are suggesting that these are mostly ionized the nitrogen is fusing to silicon and the oxygen is forming oxides with these and you end up with that iron rich crenelated microsphere falling out of the sky is, is my hypothesis um, and we see here the iron rich crenelated sphere with the other material coming in and I'm suggesting that in these systems um, they, they, the material continuously is fed into these structures which are eating it and then they're like feeding those to the mothership uh, which is the coherent matter un layer underneath <clears throat> silicon and iron being synthesized in here from carbon and oxygen of course silicon and iron fusing uh, si uh, carbon and oxygen fusing together to make <clears throat> silicon uh, rather than nitrogen and nitrogen of course there's very little nitrogen in here compared to uh, carbon coming in and um, 
oxygen in the silicon dioxide. And that, there's their synthesis process there in their view. And I showed the boron on here, okay, and uh, obviously the nitrogen here. Nitrogen is obviously in the air. These are the other products here, the calcium we can see here. And I talked about the accretion disk here. And so if this is the process that's going on, then this accretion disk, which should be carbon that's come from fossil, so-called fossil fuels, that should have no carbon-14 in it. So I propose that possibly either hydrogens in various forms with antineutrinos and 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 electrons uh, so protons atomic hydrogen antineutrinos and 12 carbon various combinations either go directly to 14 nitrogen um, uh, and possibly 14 carbon and most of the 14 carbon immediately decays to 14 nitrogen but if there is some residual 14 carbon left over then um, we uh, might see that on a beam line and if we do this might upend a very long-held belief about what creates carbon-14 in the environment and with that uh, I'll see if there's any more questions uh, and I'll close out <clears throat> Yeah, J Justin Ford has said some um, carbon in petrol may be from additives, e.g., ethanol. Yeah, what, what, what I'm that that's that is possible, um, of course. Um, I actually intended to do the reverse in the supernova reactor, and if I get the relationship with the beam line, I will, where I'm taking actual charcoal and I'm running that in the supernova to create iron and silicon, as we've observed in the past in these crenelated spheres and stuff, and to see if it lowers the amount of 14 carbon in that um, sample. Some great ideas, thank you. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'm going to say thank you very much, guys. I have something else to do before I can rest tonight. Uh, so I will say uh, this was possibly how uh, there is uh, no or rather m apparently missing carbon we know we are seeing these iron rich crenelated microspheres and other products that come from this George Joshua reaction tree but no one is looking for the nitrogen content in there and is there this change in the isotopic ratio of carbon if there is, then we might have a new understanding of how some of the atmospheric carbon-14 is formed. So, with that said, I'll say buenas noches, dobra not, good night. And for those that I haven't spoken to before, happy new year. And I hope it's a prosperous and exciting one. And I hope the people that are working in the field of Lena uh, have some major breakthroughs this year. And we can start building products for improving the environment and producing clean energy and for cleaning up the mess of things like Fukushima. So with that, I'll say adieu.